Luke 14. I'm going to read uh, a few verses. We're going to look at a pretty long paragraph, and I'm not going to read the entire paragraph, but I'm going to read the last part of the text, and then we will work our way uh, to that conclusion. And so if you look at Luke chapter 14, and I want to pick up reading with verse uh, 12. I'm reading from the New King James Version of the Holy Scripture. Then he also said to him who invited him, when you give a dinner or a supper, do not ask your friends, your brothers, your relatives, nor your rich neighbors, lest they also invite you back and you be repaid. But when you give a feast, invite the poor, the maimed, the lame, the blind, and you will be blessed because they cannot repay you. For you shall be repaid at the resurrection of the just. Now when one of those who sat at the table with him heard these things, he said to him, Blessed is he who shall eat bread in the kingdom of God. Then he said to him, A certain man gave a great supper and invited many, and sent his servant at supper time to say to those who were invited, Come, for all things are now ready. But they all with one accord began to make excuses. The first said to him, I have bought a piece of ground. I must go and see it. I ask you to have me excused. And another said, I have bought five yoke of oxen, and I'm going to test them. I ask you to have me excused. Still another said, I have married a wife, and therefore I cannot come. So that servant came and reported these things to his master. Then the master of the house, being angry, said to the servants, Go out into the streets and lanes of the city and bring in here the poor and the, and the lame and the blind. And the servant said, Master, it is done as you have commanded. And still there is room. Then the master said to the servant, go out into the highways and hedges and compel them to come in that my house may be filled. For I say to you that none of those who were invited shall taste my supper. May the Lord's rich blessing be to his word. May we sanctify in our hearts. Let's pray together, shall we? Father, we bow before you in the mighty name of Jesus. We ask that you would open our eyes, our understanding to your word that we might see Jesus in all of his matchless splendor and glory. And help us, Father, to embrace the word of the living God. In Jesus' name we pray and give thanks. Amen. Amen. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. I want to speak to you this morning from the subject of characteristics of kingdom citizens. They show up for the big party characteristics of kingdom citizens, they show up for the big party. On last evening, my wife's uncle and, and he celebrated their 50th wedding anniversary, which is a monumental achievement in times like we live today. And they had worked feverishly on putting together the plans and putting everything together and they put together a beautiful invitation with a picture of my wife's uncle and his wife. One picture was when they got married and they were just barely out of their teen years. And then another picture juxtaposed next to that one of them 50 years removed. It was a beautiful invitation. And they sent it out to relatives primarily because the family is so large and to some select friends. And I was kind of surprised that some of the people who didn't show up. At the last minute, they called and they said, uh, I've got to do such and such and so and so. Please consider me excused. Uh, I got to run to the towns in the mall or to Walmart. Uh, please consider me excused. And it was a great loss on their part because it was an absolutely fabulous and marvelous evening. But people can often be preoccupied with the mundane, the repetitive, and the routine, and they really miss out on the big party. 
So it is in the kingdom of God. And as today, churches all over this city, this state, and all over this nation, and many are not nearly as filled as this one here this morning. For at every church service, there are people that are absent that really should be there. They don't have a real legitimate excuse. Some would say, well, I forgot that daylight saving time was going to spring me forward. Therefore, I was late. Please consider me excused. <laughs> but for whatever the reason, there will be those who will not show up for the big party. So it is in this text. But failure to show up where we're supposed to be and when we have been invited may be an indication that we really and truly are not a kingdom citizen and we really don't know the king. That's the big idea in this passage right here, but you got to back up to verse 1 to really get that it culminates in this last section of this paragraph in verses 23 and 24. So if we back up in verse 1, it says, now it happened. And what that simply means is that there's been a time frame that has lapsed since the conclusion of verse 35 in, in chapter 13. So Jesus is invited to the house of a Pharisee who happens to be a ruler, a chief Pharisee, if you will, to eat bread on the Sabbath day. Now that right there, by now, if you've been here very many times the last several months, you know this is going to be something significant. The fact that Luke say they're meeting for a meal and they're meeting on the Sabbath day because we know anytime the Sabbath day is introduced, it's going to result in some controversy because the Jewish elite, they had distilled down their religious belief, their religious system to the Sabbath day. And they felt that their ability to keep the Sabbath, to observe the last day of the week, to, reserve, to, to, to observe it religiously, was an indication of their spirituality. So they had came up with criteria that they had developed that spelled out how you keep the Sabbath. And if you keep the Sabbath like this, it makes you a spiritual person. It didn't matter to them how they treat their mother or their father. It didn't matter if they were apathetic and indifferent toward the poor. It didn't matter if they were preoccupied with their own selfish indulgence, but if they were able to keep the Sabbath according to their prescription, according to their formula, they considered themselves to be spiritual. So Jesus catapults on the scene, and he dismantles their theological framework to show them that their observance of the Sabbath is woefully inadequate. They only have an understanding of what the Sabbath was all about, and they have set up a false set of criteria to justify themselves. And they have erroneously concluded that they are spiritual when they are not spiritual at all. They're very carnal and they're not true citizens of the kingdom of God. Are you following me? So that's the setup. When he says it's the Sabbath, you know something big is getting ready to happen, something controversial. It will result in some type of confrontation, some type of conflict, because their observance of the Sabbath is not consistent with what God intended nor what his son, the Lord Jesus Christ, would elucidate during his ministry. So they meet in this Pharisee's house. It's on the Sabbath day to observe a meal. And verse 2 says, there was a certain man who, who had the dropsy, which was a debilitating disease that affected the, the neurological system and left one incapacitated and paralyzed. So he's there. Jesus looks at this man, and then he looks at the religious leaders. And in verse 3, he says to them, to the lawyers and the Pharisees, is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath day? That is a simple question. It begs for a yes, no answer. Either it's lawful to heal on the Sabbath day, or it's not lawful to heal on the Sabbath day. We don't need any equivocation. We don't need no theological nuanced answers. Can you heal a sick person on the Sabbath day or can you not heal a sick person on the Sabbath day? Jesus asked them straight up, clearly, succinctly, not complicated. Yes, you can and no, you can't. Verse 4 shows their recalcitrant, apathetic indifference toward hurting people. They remain silent. It would have been better off had they been wrong and said, no, you can't do it. But to have no compassion, no sympathy, no empathy for a person that was paralyzed in front of them, to have no sense of obligation to try to mitigate this person's suffering and pain, 
was an indication that their hearts and spirits were bankrupt and that it, would, it was void of the presence of God. And so they remained silent. Sometimes the worst response that we can have to the human dilemma is to be indifferent. Either be passionate about what it is you're going to do. Just be passionate about it. Look at people hurting. Look at people that are poor. Look at people who are trapped in situations and circumstances of dysfunction, of sin, or whatever it might be. Look at them and say, it's their fault. I'm not going to help them. They're just tired. They're trifling. They don't deserve my help. But don't be indifferent. <laughs> don't, don't just be indifferent. Don't act like you don't see them when you do see them. Jesus said, I would rather that you were hot or cold than be lukewarm and indifferent. And so indifference is the sign of a cold, calloused heart that has become shellacked over with pride and narcissistic self-centeredness. And so Jesus now is going to set these guys up, or they've really set themselves up. They remain silent. They remain silent. That's an indictment against the church. It's an indictment against the church when we are silent toward the plight of the poor, the oppressed, the disenfranchised, the homeless, the incarcerated, the ill, the infirm. It's an indictment against us when we are silent. As the people of God, we are to have the heart of God and the compassion of God, and we are to be moved with compassion. When we see human pain and suffering, we can't address it all, we can't deal with it all, but we can lift the issue up and we can plead the case and the cause for the poor and the oppressed. But they were silent. And then Jesus in verse 5, he, he says to them, which of you having a donkey, a jackass, or an ox that has fallen into a pit? and will not immediately pull him out on the Sabbath day. He asks the question that touches them where they really is, live. They valued their livestock. They valued their donkeys and their ox and their cattle and all their beasts of burden because in an agrarian society, you needed these beasts of burdens to plow the field, to turn over the soil and to harvest in the crops. So a person's donkey, a person's mule, a person's ox was of great value to them and they treated them better than they did most people. So it is in our society today. There are some doctors, I mean there are some animals that get better health care than a lot of folk. We got animal hospitals and we should be humane toward animals, don't get me wrong. I got a little dog and I love her to death. But she's always glad to see me when nobody else is. So I love her to death. I pick her up, I hug her, I talk to her. She's always glad to see me. I get up early in the morning, let her out, and I give her a treat. She just spins around in the floor. She's just happy. It don't take much to make her happy. And so I'm compassionate toward animals. Don't think that I'm some sadistic, indifferent person toward animals. But we, and very often, can be more compassionate toward an animal than we are a human being. And that's what Jesus is showing here with these religious leaders. So here he exposes the, the first characteristic of a kingdom citizen. Kingdom citizens are compassionate. Kingdom citizens are compassionate toward the bruised, the battered, the manhandled, the mauled, the disfigured, and the dysfunctional. Kingdom citizens are compassionate because kingdom citizens understand, except by the grace of God, there goes me, I've not lived so well. I've not been so spiritual, I've not been so faithful to God that it resulted in me not being homeless, not being crippled, not being maimed. It's only by the grace of God. So a kingdom citizens live with this tremendous tension of knowing that it's only by the grace of God, it's only the good hand of God that has shielded me and protected me from the various vicissitudes, complications, and destructions that could have befallen me. Kingdom citizens are compassionate toward the hurting, the aching. And so Jesus tries to pull on their heartstrings and say, if you can show compassion for your donkey and for your ox, cannot you show compassion for this man here that's before you? 
And if on the Sabbath day you will justify being able to pull your ox or your donkey out of the ditch because it would be inhumane to leave them there in that ditch, is it not so inhumane to leave a person that is hurting in their dilemma? See, the greatest truth is the truth that you discover for yourself. And so rather than tell people the obvious answer, Jesus would lead them and then allow them to discover the truth for themselves and then decide whether or not they would embrace the truth or reject it. So the principle is kingdom citizens are compassionate toward the hurting. And what he's saying to them subliminally, if you're not compassionate toward the hurting, it might mean that you're not truly a kingdom citizen. That's the hidden message. And then he moves on. Verse 7. So he told a parable to those who were invited. When he noted they chose the best places, saying to them, We, when you are invited by anyone by, by, to a wedding feast, do not sit down in the best place, lest one more honorable than you be invited by him. And he who invited you and him come and say to you, Give place to this man. Then you began with shame to take the lowest place. But when you are invited, go and sit down in the lowest place so that when he who invited you comes, he may say to you, friend, go up higher. Then you will have glory in the presence of those who sit at the table with you. For whoever exalts himself will be abased and who humbles himself will be exalted. The second principle, kingdom citizens are humble. They don't exalt themselves, they allow others to exalt them and to lift them up. Let the words of others speak well of you. And so he says, in a simple parable, you guys are used to parading in a place, and y'all just assume that the chief seat is reserved for you. So whenever you see a sign that says, reserved for the big shot, you just go up in there and just plop yourself down as if you automatically are supposed to be in the big seat. He says, no, no, that's not what a kingdom citizen does. A kingdom citizen is just happy just to get the invitation to be in the house. So a kingdom citizen does not assume that they're the one being honored. A kingdom citizen is not assuming. They take a seat in the back, and they wait till someone come and lift them up and elevate them and bring them up to a higher seat so they can see that they are being honored by the host who's invited them. Are you following? Now, don't misinterpret this there. So, see, the, in the church, we misinterpret this. So we think this means we should come and sit in the back of the church. That's not what that means. That's, that's, not, that's not what that means. No, no, no. No, it doesn't mean that the back is reserved for you. All right, leave the back open for somebody who comes and just come on the slide. And you can bring yourself on down to the front. I'm inviting you to the front. But the kingdom citizen is, is humble. The kingdom citizen does not blow his or her own trumpet or horn. The kingdom citizen allows others to speak highly of them and allows others' words to lift them up or exalt them in due time. A kingdom citizen understands that we humble ourselves under the mighty hand of God. For in due time, if it pleases him, he will lift us up. He will exalt us. He doesn't spend a lot of time here. He just lays down the principle and let them wrestle with it and deal with it. Kingdom citizens are compassionate, they were not. Kingdom citizens are humble, they were not. The third principle in verse 12. Then he also said to him who invited him, now he speaks directly to the guy who invited him to the dinner. Because any time the Pharisees invited Jesus to a dinner on the Sabbath day, it was a setup. They were trying to set him up, you see, to some kind of way they could discredit him that he would say or teach something that would come in to conflict and contradiction with what they taught, then they could accuse him of not being a true Jew and accuse him of violating the Sabbath. Are you following? So now he speaks directly to him. He says, now you, when you give a dinner, don't ask your friends to come, your brothers and your relatives and your rich neighbors. <laughs> Okay, directly to the guy. All you do is invite your friends, your brothers, your neighbors, your rich friends, because all you believe in, you believe in reciprocity. In the legal world, they call it quid pro quo, quo this for that. You don't invite nobody unless you know they're going to invite you back. You never extend an invitation unless you know that person has the, mean, the means 
to reciprocate and return the favor. You don't do nothing out of the goodness of your own heart. Instead of inviting all your big shot friends and all of your neighbors from the same socioeconomic level that you're in, why don't you invite the poor? Why don't you invite the maimed and the lame and the blind? Why don't you invite some unemployed folk who come in and just eat up all the food? Drink up everything you got to drink. And then ask you, is there anything else left you got? You got any food stamps? Can we go to Walmart? They just want it all. Invite somebody that you know don't deserve to be on your guest list. And give to them because God loves the hilarious giver. And those who give to the poor, the Bible says they're giving to God. They're investing with God. He said, if you do that, then you're going to be repaid. You're going to be recompensed at the resurrection of the just. You see, kingdom citizens not only are compassionate and humble, but they are also generous. And they give to the poor, not expecting anything in return. And they wait, and they're patient. They believe that God will repay. And God may not repay at the end of every day, but in the end, God pays. God will recompense. God will reconcile the books. God will always balance the books. He will never be indebted to anyone. He will always pay. I had a humbling experience the other day. I have them all the time, you know. I had a humbling experience, lest I think I'm a big shot, just because I get invited with the big shots. I know I'm a little shot. I'm no big shot. And my bank account testifies to that, you see. And so I get invited, and I go up to the state Capital. They invite me up all the time to come and testify and, and so forth and so on. So I'm up there talking. And so we come into this room and they got all of this candy. I mean, they got baskets full, preacher. Baskets full of candy in this particular office. Now I just assume. I just, just assume, you know, people around here work where they know I, I don't eat much during the day because it slows me down. So I just don't like to eat during the day. I just assume that that's for the guests. And so I take a little old bag of peanuts with raisins in it, which I like. And I go into the meeting while the people are talking. It's 3 o'clock. I haven't eaten anything all day. And so I'm eating. I'm just listening. And so on the way out, I'm going to pick up my grandson. I say, well, he liked these M&Ms. <laughs> they got about, it's at least 150, Brother Green, at least 150 bag of M&Ms in this basket. I picked up one, one pack of M&M's with peanuts. And there was a room full of people. And I'm getting ready to go out the door. And the woman says to me, Reverend Watts, <laughs> that's not for you. That candy is for those people who are coming in this office to be in meetings in that room. I almost cursed. But I didn't. I gave it up a long time ago, but I didn't. But my blood pressure went from about 115 over 65 to at least 300 over 200. But I took a real deep breath. I mean, I probably almost exploded my lungs. I, I breathed in so deeply. And it was totally quiet in that room. And I stuck my hand in my pocket. And I turned around, I walked back, and I took out a $5 bill. And I laid it down. I said, I am so sorry. I did not know that that candy was reserved for the politically elite. Please excuse me. And I believe that this will take care of the two bags, of, a bag of peanuts and m ms I ate today and the bag that Bob Hardy ate yesterday. <laughs> and I said, now consider me excused. I was reminded, <coughs> I'm not no big shot. They might put my articles in the Charleston Gazette because they ain't got nothing else to put in there. That's why. And they might call me to interview me on TV because they ain't got nobody else to talk to. But every now and then, they will remind me of a bag of peanuts and a pack of m ms I'm really not in that elite group of folk that can eat the peanuts and the m ms And I accept that. Because I went out there thinking, for $5, I could have bought me a couple of bags of m and peanuts <laughs> and just carried around in my briefcase. There was nothing special about those, you see. 
You're reminded of who you are by the grace of God. But he says the kingdom citizen is compassionate, humble, and generous because the kingdom citizen believes that God is going to pay back all those things that we do in secret to people who cannot pay us back. God will pay us back. I was up there with Brother Glenn Walker. And men around Glenn just kind of lift your spirit. He just lifts your spirits, man. He just lifts my spirit. I was just, just feeling real good just being with him and meeting with people. He had me giving presentations to folk and talking to different people. So when we finished the this meeting, I had these books, my brother-in-law's and my sister's books that I carry around and tell people, y'all need to use this in your program and uh, talks my father never had with me and talks my mother never had with me. And so I just say, look, just, just take the books. And I, I gave away about $200 worth of books. And I said, the spirit of Mother Phyllis Tolliver and Tom Tolliver come on me. What's wrong with me? I, think, I, I got in my car I was coming by. I got to get to be with $200 worth of books. And now I got to go and pay for them because they keep an inventory of the books. Just for a moment, though, I forgot who I was. I thought I was Phyllis Tolliver. I thought I was Tom Tolliver. I thought I was Ben Tolliver, giving generous and kind people. But God will repay. God will repay. Every time we do something to help someone for the right motive, not that we're trying to bribe someone, we're just doing it so we're trying to help. God will recompense. God will repay. A kingdom citizen understands that. A few more minutes and I'll be through. Now, here comes the big idea. The first 14 verses builds up to the last 15, or the last nine verses. So in verse 15, after addressing the guy who had invited him to the dinner and told the guy, you got the wrong guest list. Everybody on this list are people who can pay you back, even me, because you know I can multiply bread and fish. So you know I can pay you back. And everybody else you've invited can pay you back. When are you going to give to someone just because you can do it? And because you're trying to affirm their dignity and be a blessing to them. So now somebody was eavesdropping. Verse 15. Now one of those who sat at the table with him heard these things. And he said to him, blessed is he who shall eat bread in the kingdom of God. And he made a rude, crude miscalculation. He just assumed because he was there with Jesus that he was going to be in the kingdom. So he says, blessed is everybody who's going to eat bread in the kingdom of God. Oh, how blessed we're going to be. You know what they say when you assume, don't you? So he makes this great assumption that he is going to be in the kingdom of God just because he's been going to church and paying some tithes and offerings. So now Jesus got to speak to him. Verse 16, then he said to him, because Jesus knows that the man who makes the statement, he's not only speaking for himself, there are others in that group who 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 will subscribe to that same belief. They believe that they're going to be in the kingdom. Now, Jesus speaks to him specifically and to the rest of the group generally. Now, watch this. He said to them, a certain man gave a great supper, and he invited anybody. So we have a parable of the great supper. The invitations are extended in this text. The context is the invitations are extended to the entire Jewish nation. Because Jesus in this parable is the certain man. And he's the one who is having this great big party, this great banquet supper. And he sends out all of these invitations. Just as my, sister, my, mother, my, my wife and her cousin did for her cousin's parents. Send all these invitations. And to their amazement, and in the text, to the man's amazement, when people were supposed to RSVP, they sent back an excuse. Now watch this. Verse 18, but they all with one accord began to make excuses. And the first one said, I'm sorry, I'm in the real estate. I just bought a piece of ground. I must go and see it. Please consider me excused. Now Jesus often in parables would use hyperbole, right? Gross exaggeration to show how ridiculous excuses can be. Who in their right mind would buy a piece of property without seeing it first? So this guy says, look, I bought the property. I haven't looked at it yet. I got to go look at the property. I've already closed on and paid the money for it, so please just consider me excused. A flimsy excuse. The second person, RSVP, he says, look, I just bought five yoke of oxen. That's a major investment to buy five yoke of oxen. But I haven't tried them out yet. 
I just bought an Escalade. I just bought my new Rhodes, uh, uh, Road, Road Ranger. I just bought uh, uh, a new Mercedes Benz four wheel drive, but I haven't test drove it yet. I paid for it, but I haven't test drove it yet. So ex excuse me so I can go test drive my new automobile. That's some excuse to give to a friend who's inviting you to a large banquet, supper, or feast. They get even more ridiculous as they go. And still another one said, man, I just got married. Therefore, I can't come. What getting, what getting married got to do with them going to a banquet feast? That could be a part of the celebration. He's showing how ridiculous the excuses can be. And he's also going to show not only are the excuses ridiculous, but what the excuses often will cause one to forfeit. So the principle is this. Kingdom citizens, they accept the invitations from the king. So then look at what Jesus says. Now I'll wrap this up. Verse 21. So that servant came and reported these things to his master. Master, we didn't send all these invitations. Here's the guest list, and we got the RSVPs back, and man, you won't believe some of these excuses. Then the master of the house was angry. He was angry at being spurned. He was angry at being rejected, his gracious invitation to come and to be his guest at a voluptuous banquet meal. So the master said, well, let's do this. Go out into the streets and get the cripple. Bring in the street folk. Bring in the homeless, the cripple, the maimed, the blind, the lame. Bring them in. And the servant said, Master, we've done that too. And they're still wrong. <laughs> they're still wrong. Then the master said to the servant, now just go back out again. This time, go over on Grant Street, where they sling crack cocaine like it's a McDonald's. Go on 3rd and Bream, go on Stockton, go on 1st, 2nd, 3rd, and 4th, go on to 7th. Go on to Washington Orchard, Little Page. Go get the gangbangers, the thugs, the pimps, the prostitutes. See if they want to come. Because my house is going to be full. My house is going to be full. So they go back out into the hedges and to the highways. Now, here is the moral, the, the, the moral of this parable. The moral of this parable is this. The party will go on whether you and I show up or not. God is preparing to throw a voluptuous party, a banquet feast in the kingdom of God. And so the invitations has gone out. And he first went out to the Jews as a national entity, as the chosen people of God. And God sent his son, Jesus Christ, to preach the gospel of the kingdom of God to the descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. But the Jews loved their religion, and they loved their religious system more than they loved the truth of God, and more than they loved the word of God. So they rejected the truth teller of the Lord Jesus Christ, and they rejected the invitation to come to the kingdom of God. And then God thrust open the doors of his kingdom. And he said, well, go and get them Gentile dogs. Go and get the folk who were not a part of God's original covenant with Abraham. Go out and get those who God will graft into the covenant and bring them in from every nation, tongue, and kingdom because my house is going to be full. Amen. And extend the good news of the gospel, the grace of God, to those who many would think they're not qualified, they're not deserving of salvation, but reach out that gospel net into those huts and into those villages, into those dens of iniquity, because there's someone there whose heart is aching, who yearns for a change, and will respond to the truth of God. And then he says, verse 24, For I say to you that none of those men who were invited should taste my supper. <laughs> now, if you go all the way back up to verse 15, he's talking to this one guy. 
Your lips are already smacking. You can already taste the bread in the kingdom of God. You, you already can taste the milk and the honey. You already think you can taste the new wine, but you're not going to get into the kingdom because you rejected to respond to the invitation. As I shared with you before, a theologian much wiser than myself once said that some people will drop into hell from the gates of heaven. Like this man in this text, they thought they were in the kingdom of God. They thought they would be in the kingdom of God, but they showed no sign. They did not display the characteristics of kingdom citizens. They were not compassionate. They were not humble. They were not generous. They did not respond to the invitation to come. And so this is the last opportunity for them to recognize their condition and respond to the good news of the gospel of the grace of God. Well, I trust that all of us here this morning will take seriously our responsibility to embrace the gospel and to trust Christ and to allow him to, allow him to produce in us the fruit of the Spirit and that we might show forth the character and the nature of God. You know, every now and then, Someone will, I'll run into someone in the thoroughfare of life. And they will say, you know, I, I, I saw your daughter over at the hospital. She looked just like you. She looked just like you. And she acted just like you. And that can be good and bad. <laughs> but she does. I got a few redeeming qualities. And I trust that she's embraced those more than she has my foibles and my faults. But nothing could bring more joy to my heart when someone says something nice about one of my children. Nothing could bring more joy to my heart. There's nothing could fill my heart with the joy that that fills my heart with. Nothing anybody could say about me, but when they say something complimentary about my children, that encourages me that maybe Somewhere along the line, and all of the fun bumbling around that I've tried to do as a father, maybe I said something right, maybe I did something right, that they, were to, that they embraced, and it's manifested itself in them in a positive way to where that character is being brought forth. Nothing blesses the heart of God. Nothing blesses God's hearts any more than to see his children walking in the truth. Nothing brings more joy to God other than someone coming to faith in Christ than to see his character being manifest in those who name the name of Christ. Let's bless the heart of God. Let's bless our Heavenly Father. And let's surrender to the Holy Spirit and ask him to forge in us the characteristics of kingdom citizens and that it will show forth in a way that people will conclude that we're God's children and they'll be drawn to him and desire to know him as their heavenly father. Amen? Amen. Amen. Let us bow for the other prayer, shall we? Father, we bow before you in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We thank you, Lord, for the joy and for the privilege that we have to come together as brothers and sisters in Christ. And we are greatly encouraged that you have men and women, boys and girls, who every week go through hardship, and difficulty, disappointment, hurt, heartache, and setbacks. But they still rise on Sunday. They don't offer an excuse. They say, I've been invited by my father and his son and the Holy Spirit to, to dine with them and with my brothers and sisters in Christ around the table that we will prepare for us at our church. I believe I will rise and prepare myself and I will go. Not that I necessarily feel like it or even want to go, but I've been invited and I want to honor my father by showing up to show him that I'm still committed to his kingdom. Help us, Lord, to develop that mindset. 
to be compassionate, humble, generous, and on a daily basis responding to your invitation to follow you so that you can lead God, direct us to become fishers of men and women and boys and girls. If there's one here this morning, Father, who've never bowed and confessed their sin to you and turned to you for salvation by putting their trust and their faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, I trust that you would open their heart today that they might receive Christ their personal Savior. For it's in Jesus' name we pray and give thanks. Amen. Every head bowed, every eye closed. If there's someone here this morning that you've come out of whatever situation, whatever circumstance that you've had to deal with this past week, and maybe it's a long time struggle, but this morning you realize that you really need to be saved. You need to experience God's forgiveness in your life. I invite you where you are this morning to realize that God loves you. He sent his son, the Lord Jesus Christ, to die on the cross, a vicarious substitutionary death. And he's already taken the punishment that you deserve. And he offers you, in exchange for your sin, he offers you forgiveness and salvation. That is the invitation. And you by faith must say, yes, Lord Jesus, I receive you. I trust you as my Lord and Savior. Come into my heart. Come into my life and save me. If you pray that prayer, the Lord will save you in today. And he'll begin the work of encouraging you and strengthening you to be the person he's called you to be. If you prayed that prayer, just raise your hand right where you are. We're not going to make you walk the aisle and have no big show. But someone will come and talk with you and pray with you to help you understand what it means to call upon the name of the Lord. Is there one? The doors of the church are open. The invitation is extended. Whosoever will, let him or her come and drink of the water of life freely. Is there one? Let us stand together on 529, Oh, How I Love Jesus. You can still come. That's all right, Lionel. There is a name I love to hear. I love to sing its words. It sounds like music in my ear. The sweetest name on earth. Oh, how I love Jesus. 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 Because he first loved me. Stand to two. He tells me of a Savior who died to set me free. And for me of his precious blood, the sinners perfectly. Oh, how I love Jesus. Oh, how I love Jesus. Oh, how I love Jesus. Because he first stands afore. He tells me whose loving heart. Sorrow that none can bear below. Oh, how I love Jesus! Oh, how I love Jesus! Oh, how I love Jesus! Oh, 
Greet somebody and tell them how good God has been to you. Amen? Amen. I want to remind all of you on Saturday. Saturday, listen up. This is very important. Most important thing I've said all morning. Saturday at 1 o'clock. At 1 o'clock. At 1 o'clock. Everybody say 1 o'clock. Saturday. All right, they're having the Black History Bowl. The Black History Bowl. That's at the YM YMCA. Is that right, sister? At the YMCA at 1 o'clock, we need to have some people up there in the stands to cheer on our Black History Bowl team Saturday at 1 o'clock.